Welcome to our weekly Facebook Live. Today we are going to be talking about uh, growing your survival garden. And uh, first of all, um, I want to talk about uh, why we might want to shift how we think about our garden and then, um, and then talk about very specifics and how a survival garden is different than your usual fruits and vegetable garden or flower garden. Um, so last year, most of us experienced the great toilet paper shortage. Do you remember that? Um, people at the beginning of the pandemic, when we first started talking about shutting down and before they actually started closing um, businesses and asking people to stay home, um, people went and stocked up on toilet paper. Sounds pretty normal. Um, but then some people got the idea that they could stock up even more and make a profit by selling it to people who couldn't get it. And things got completely out of hand. And uh, then because of other things to do with the pandemic, there was a huge lack of toilet paper. Now, for me, that was kind of weird because toilet paper is produced in British Columbia, where I live. Um, the pulp mills are pretty close by and there shouldn't be any shortage of toilet paper anywhere in Western Canada. Um, but there was. And we thought, um, you know, it took probably three months before things settled down. And then all of a sudden, um, toilet paper was rationed, uh, limit four rolls per family. And then um, you could get a larger package after a little while. And then finally, there was there was no um, um what would you call it? Um, no rationing. We could have as much toilet paper as we wanted. And until that is September. When September came, all of a sudden, the stores were out of toilet paper again. Um, and it didn't make any sense. We had no shutdown. Um, things, businesses had been open. Uh, factories were social distance, but still open. It didn't make any sense why in September we ran out of toilet paper again. But sure enough, we went into Costco. There was no toilet paper. Now, some stores had toilet paper. Some stores didn't. Um, some brands were missing, but other brands were there. Um, and then uh, some stores started rationing again, limiting it to two packages per family. Um, and it was interesting. Um, also, the price had gone up considerably to what it was in February and March in 2020. Uh, by September, we were seeing prices rise to um, anywhere from 25% to 40% more than it was before, before the first shutdown in March. Um, and those price rises have continued. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, one is the social distancing. One is um, lack of supply, um, supply shortages, um, sometimes there are transportation shortages. And also many countries have started adding a carbon tax onto goods. And, and when there's a carbon tax onto goods um, or onto fuel, that translates into an increase in price on goods, all goods, everything that has to be transported ends up having that carbon tax on. And, and you probably know that in the last um, four weeks or so, we've, we've seen gas shoot up as well. So in Canada, we've had carbon taxes and technically we shouldn't have fuel shortages because Canada produces fuel. Um, but even in Canada, we're experiencing in gas price increases and we're experiencing additional um, we're seeing that filter through into uh, food, um, into anything that's trucked, ends up having an increase in gas. Farmers are going to be shortly facing that increase because, um, because of fuel. And uh, we're just going to be seeing uh, food prices rise. And they're predicting, economists are predicting that we could see food prices double by September um, or more. Or more, they're talking about runaway inflation. So that is a huge reason for, for starting to think a little differently about our gardens. Um, so what is a survival garden? Um, if you're here, say hi, let us know you're here, that you're listening. And um, if you have questions about survival gardens, or if you have a story to share about your survival garden, go ahead, type it into the comments. Um, I'm on Zoom. Sarah's going to transfer that to me and so that I can see your response. 
Um, so what is a survival garden? How is it different than just a vegetable garden? Um, so during World War I and World War II, um, there was a large government push to get people to grow gardens and they called them victory gardens. And a survival garden is much like a victory garden. The purpose behind a victory garden was for families, not just to raise fruits and vegetables, but to help with the war effort by um, things like combing the countryside for herbal medicines. And um, even the Girl Guides and the Boy Scouts got involved uh, collecting herbal medicines, um, things like rose hips for vitamin C. Um, England was cut off from a lot of their foodstuffs by the German U-boats. And so they, um, the government pushed to have people grow more food so that they could supplement what they would normally have gotten from Europe. They had to grow themselves. And so, um, and that filtered over to North America as well. In North America, the push was more, again, we were cut off from many supplies. Um, and the push was to release more um, commodities to the troops. So if people could grow food at home, more could be available to feed the troops overseas. And so the whole purpose of the Victory Gardens was to supplement the diet um, and keep people healthy. Um, also, food was rationed. So you could only have so much flour, so much sugar. If you raise chickens, you could only have um, a certain amount per hen to feed them. And then the rest you had to supplement with what you could grow. And then talk a little bit more about chickens and rabbits a little bit later in the talk. So when you're looking at a survival garden, you're looking at number one, calories. Um, I know calories are a bad word for a lot of us, um, especially people that are trying to do weight management. But when you're talking about a survival garden, calories are very important. A lot of people, when they approach their garden, um, if it's a vegetable garden, the thought process that they go through is um, what's very expensive in the store um, I'm going to grow those things so I can save money. Um, and I want you to make, if that's how you're thinking about your garden, I want you to do a little bit of a shift and start thinking, if I had to, to raise 50% of the food that my family eats, what would I have to grow? Um, because food is going to get more expensive. When we come into September, um, already there are some commodities that um, won't be coming in. The, um, I was talking with my membership um, people on, uh, on Tuesday about this, and they're already seeing shortages in their stores for basics. Um, the, uh, the grain storage that our countries uh, used to have is empty right now. And we already know that there's going to be a shortage of things like wheat, um, corn, soybeans in the fall because they were already planted. Um, farmers have to plant when they're told they have to plant if they want crop insurance. And the banks where their mortgages are held say you must have crop insurance. So the crop insurance companies told the farmers to plant. And then we had this terrible cold spell. Some places had snow even. And uh, plants like soybeans um, are gone. There won't be a harvest for those areas that were too cold. Um, we usually can make it through that, um, but we know that last fall we didn't have the wheat harvest we were expecting. It was down, I believe the number was 30%. Um, so when things like that happen, you know that's gonna, anything that is harvested, the price is gonna go up. So we can expect to see um, huge price increases in September, October, when the new crops come in. So if you don't have wheat or you have less wheat or less bread, um, processed food is going to go up because they all depend on those cheap foodstuffs, cheap in air quotes. Um, what can we grow in our gardens that's going to supplement our family's diet? Um, so the first thing is high caloric plants. Um, high caloric um, crops, things like potatoes, um, or if you're farther south, sweet potatoes would be really important right now. Um, also squash like pumpkins, um, summer, um, not summer squash, but other winter squash, pumpkins, um, delicata squash, all of those long keeping squash, those are things that you can grow and you can keep in a cold storage um, 
here in Canada, uh, if I have a mature pumpkin that I harvest from my garden, it will keep till March for me in cold storage. So that's a really good way to make sure your family has calories. Pumpkins can be used in place of uh, where you'd use potatoes, um, where you would use sweet potatoes, you could use a pumpkin or a winter squash. So that gives you calories and also they're very rich in vitamin A, uh, which is really important. And also they're fresh, so they're, they're gonna be rich in vitamin C as well. So those are things that you can grow um, and they're pretty easy to grow. Those are the kinds of crops, um, sweet potatoes, uh, potatoes, pumpkin, squash. Once you get it in the ground and you weed around it those first couple of times, the plants have a lot of bulk um, and they will continue to grow um, without a lot of weeding afterwards. Um, other crops that are survival crops, sunchokes or um, sun, sunchokes, again, you plant them, they're perennials. So you plant them, uh, harvest them in the fall, late fall, and uh, you should be good to go. And I actually planted sunchokes just from plants I got out of the grocery store. So you don't have to go looking for special seed. Um, just get it at the grocery store and put it in the ground. And um, it's in most places, it's not too late to plant now. Um, in fact, the things I'm telling you now, um, other than potatoes, which I already have in the ground and mulched, um, I haven't planted these yet in my garden. So you still have time. Um, then um, other high calorie and high nutrition crops would be maize um, or corn, sweet corn, um, or flower corn, dent corn, uh, beans and peas. So if you're in a colder area, field peas are a great thing to plant. In fact, in Canada, um, way back uh, when we didn't have grocery stores and when we didn't have um, places to get food in the middle of winter, people planted field peas, um, like for dried peas and pea soup was a tradition. Even when I was growing up, uh, pea soup was an important staple in my home. My mother every Saturday put on a pot of pea soup and we ate it on Sunday. Um, so pea soup is very, a uh, very important, not pea soup, sorry, peas, field peas are important um, and easy to grow. Again, once you get in, them in the ground, um, they will grow, grow for you. You don't have to do a lot of weeding and those you just leave and they dry and then you harvest and shell the peas. Um, beans are also important. Um, and, and in this case, I'm talking dried beans. Um, if you live in some of the warmer areas, you can get those dried beans going. Uh, for me, peas would be the one I choose because we don't have a long enough growing season for dried beans. But if you're a little further south or in a warmer place, even in Canada, you would be able to dry beans on the plants. Um, and of course, even if you can't do dried beans, green beans are good and they do have some protein. Um, and then the other thing you want to, um, so we've talked so far, we've talked about starches, potatoes, sweet potatoes, sunchokes, and we've talked about um, maize, and we've talked about corn and beans and peas. Um, the other thing that's important is having a source of oil, especially omega-3 oils um, in your home, because um, a lot of the oils that we can buy um, in the store are lacking in omega-3 and omega-3 is an essential oil that um, not like the bottle smelly essential oils, but an essential oil that your body needs. And for health, it's very important to have a balance of omega-3 um, and omega-6. And that's something that we often don't have. Some people take supplements, um, but it's better to get it in your food. So sunflower seeds um, are a good source and so are flax seeds. And both of those are very easy to grow in the garden. In fact, you can take grocery store sunflower seeds, um, bird seed, um, not the cooked salted kind, but the raw sunflower seeds that are in the shell, uh, bird, black oil, sunflowers, bird seed, um, if, you, if you don't have um, sprouting seed. Uh, you can also use what you'd use for microgreens. Uh, if you bought sunflower seeds for microgreens, you can plant those. Um, and then flax seed. Um, again, you could get that going. Um, you could also use poppy, poppy seed, bread seed poppy um, would also give a good source of omega-3s. 
Um, and that just gives you, so I'm not, you could press the oil if you had special equipment to press the oil, but I'm not suggesting that. Um, what I'm suggesting is that you just have them and incorporate the seeds in your diet um, in order to get those omega-3s. Um, you can sprinkle them on salads. You can uh, put them in your baking. Um, there's lots of things you can do. If you have the space um, or you know where there's a source of nuts, that's also a good source of oils in a survival situation. Um, things like butternut, uh, walnut, black walnut, uh, hazelnuts, um, and if you're farther south, pecans, um, or even peanuts. Peanuts are a legume if you're farther south and can grow peanuts. Um, that's another good crop. Um, and when you're looking at what you can grow in your garden, those legumes are going to be nitrogen fixers. So those are great crops to put near heavy feeders. Um, that's why we have the three sisters um, traditional way of planting corn because the beans fed the corn um, and then squash was the third sister and they kept the ground um, cool for the roots of the corn. Um, <clears throat> So those nitrogen fixers, uh, like, like any of the legumes, beans, peas, uh, peanuts, are, uh, will help other plants grow. So it's good to plant them where there's heavy feeders. Um, now, this is not to say that you don't plant vegetables. Of course, you plant vegetables. And in a survival garden, it's good to have um, root vegetables because they can be cold storage. They don't have to be canned. They don't have to be frozen. Um, that way you have something, even if you lose power and you lose the contents of your freezer, you still have something because they're cold storage. So uh, beets, parsnips, uh, carrots, um, or any of those other root vegetables are good vegetables to grow and then storage um, cold storage, turnips, uh, radishes, um, I mean like the daikon radish, the winter radish, those are good. Um, if you have open pollinated seed and you're looking at things like radish um, or any of those Asian vegetables, you're going to want to plant them in the fall rather than in the spring because if you plant them in the spring when the heat comes those will bolt and you won't get a crop, you'll just get flowers. Um, and so you don't want to plant those, um, if you have open pollinated seeds, you don't want to plant those Asian vegetables early in the spring. Uh, normally, uh, where I am, where I get frost in September, I will plant them beginning of August. Uh, you want to plant them about uh, four to six weeks before your first frost. So whenever your first frost is going to come, you want to get them in uh, four to six weeks or whenever the temperature starts to cool where you are. So if you're farther south, as soon as you feel that um, nip in the air, that's when you want to get them in. Um, or if your nights start to get cooler. Um, and that way they won't bolt on you and you'll actually get a harvest. Um, Things like daikon radish, they don't have to be refrigerated. They can be cold storage. Onions can be cold storaged. Um, and of course, all your root vegetables. To store them, you just simply um, harvest them and then get some damp sand and bury them in damp sand in boxes in your in someplace where it's cool. Uh, if you have a root cellar, that's great. Um, I just use my, my unheated basement. Um, it's a little bit humid down there, um, but I, I have a bedroom that's not being used. I store some in the bedroom. I store some um, in actually a cool damp room um, and then some I just spread out. The one thing in cold storage you want to make sure though, um, apples give and pears give off um, methane gas. I think that's what it is. I might be wrong on what kind of gas, but they give off a gas that speeds um, their ripening. And what you, you don't want to put other fruits and vegetables in the same room with them. So don't store your onions and potatoes with your apples. If you have apples, you wanna keep them separated. So what I do is I put my apples in one room downstairs and in the basement, and then I put uh, things like pumpkins and onions and those other things, potatoes in another room so that the gas is coming off ethylene gas that's what it is it's ethylene gas um, and the um, 
the gases coming off the the uh, apples don't affect the flavor or the keeping strength of those other vegetables. Um, so we've talked about um, sort of the principles of a survivor survival garden that you want to look at calories more than um, the cost. Um, and so you want to have some starchy vegetables, you want to have some root vegetables, um, and then you want to have some protein and you want to have some um, things like beans and peas, which are going to be high in calories too. And then you also want to make sure you have a source of omega-3 fatty acids uh, for your diet. So that's looking at things like sunflowers, flaxseed, um, nuts, and other seeds. Um, and then uh and then you want to have vegetables that you don't have to rely on canning or a freezer. Now, of course, if you have a dehydrator, um, a lot of your leafy greens, even your weeds like dandelion weed um, nettles can be put in the dehydrator and you can use that um, as tea, but you can also use it powdered and put it in smoothies, add it to soups and stews to increase nutrition. And I highly recommend that if you don't already have a dehydrator and you can, uh, you have budget for one right now, I strongly recommend getting a dehydrator. Um, I tend to personally to try to avoid using the freezer if possible. Um, we got a new freezer last year and it was brand new, uh, replaced two very old freezers, more than 20 years old, um, that were still working, but I was afraid we were gonna, that it wasn't gonna work. So I, I bought one brand new freezer to replace these two. And the brand new freezer that we bought actually was miswired and it never worked. Um, and I had put all of my garden vegetables in there and the ones that I didn't can, the ones that I didn't dry. And we lost everything. Um, we realized that it wasn't, at first we thought it was working because it would freeze water, but by January, it became obvious that it had never worked properly. And when the repairman came out, he told us it was miswired. And um, it's, uh, we lost everything in the freezer, my entire garden. So whatever we hadn't eaten by January was gone. We ended up having to throw it out. Um, so I highly recommend having, um, of course, I did have a lot in cold storage. So we, we still had food. Um, but things like fennel and kale and chard, I did lose. So if you I strongly recommend you have more than one way to store food. If you're, especially if you're looking at a survival garden, um, have some that can cold storage, have some that go through your dehydrator and are stored dry, have some that you can and have some in your freezer. Um, okay, now one more thing I wanted to talk about and that is chickens and rabbits. Chickens and rabbits during World War I and World War II were key to people being able to survive. It gave them a cheap source of protein, which actually released um, things like beef to be used for the war effort because people were raising chickens and rabbits at home. Um, both chickens and rabbits do require a little bit of, of protein in the form of grain or in the form of beans, um, or some combination of say oats and peas um, in, order to, in order to survive. But they don't have to have, like rabbits don't have to have bunny rations. Um, chickens don't need to have layer pellets. You can supplement with um, peas and oats say, or wheat and um, beans, and then supplement the rest of their diet with food scraps. They can be weeds from your garden, uh, they can be scraps from your kitchen. Um, and during the war, that's what people did. Um, it was, the ration was 25% uh, came from the ration card, um, which was a supplement to, for chickens. Um, it was so much per bird and it ended up being about a half a cup of, of grain per bird per day. And then the householder would supplement with weeds, uh, berries, um, weeds from the garden, scraps. So when they peeled the carrots, the carrot, the carrot peelings would go to the chickens, for instance, if it didn't go to the soup pot. Um, and so chickens, chickens with for eggs, chickens for meat um, are a great way to supplement. If we come to the point where 
um, where food is just way too expensive. Um, and rabbits as well. I know it's not popular to talk about rabbits for food, but really, frankly, that's how people survived during World War II, especially in Germany. Um, Germany and in Europe, when they were occupied, uh, the, there were backyard rabbits. Uh, they would have a pair of rabbits in a cage, especially Holland, and uh, that would help the family survive. They could feed the rabbits on scraps. And um, when people are starving, then that's very important. Um, so the other thing is vitamins and minerals. And of course, those do come from herbs and those come from, um, from the vegetables you're growing. A lot of the vegetables that we grow, we actually don't keep, right? There's a lot of waste. About 50% of the food that's grown in North America is wasted. Um, either thrown in the compost or it doesn't make it to, um, to people, it ends up getting thrown out. And so a lot of that can be um, caught and uh, funneled back into the home, especially if you're growing your own food from a survival garden. So feeding chickens, feeding rabbits, uh, maybe feeding guinea hens, feeding quail, um, anything that can produce for you is important. Um, and if you're vegetarian, then don't think about that. Then, then think about trying to grow more beans and peas. Um, we do know, though, that the prices are going to rise. So if you just shift what you're thinking about, how you're thinking about the garden, um, if you didn't plant potatoes this year or sweet potatoes because you thought you wanted to focus on tomatoes, you might want to go and get some uh, potato seeds or sweet potato starts and just add them in a back corner just in case. Are there any questions? So when, when you are looking at um, say maize or beans and you, or, or even squash um, and you're thinking about which ones to put in your garden, as I said, it's not too late yet to plant. Um, and so it's, and there is still seed there. I just made another order from Baker Creek this week. Um, because I didn't have enough peas. And so I, um, I made another order. Baker Creek still has seed. Um, other places like True Leaf Market still has seed. So if, you, if there's some things you still need that you didn't get or you're rethinking your garden, it's not too late. Um, if, you're, if you're looking at only growing container plants because you don't have much space right now, um, potatoes can be grown in a bag. Honestly, in just a bag on your on your deck or your balcony, they don't take up much space. Um, the potatoes will be smaller than if they're grown in the ground, um, but you can still get some potatoes from that. Um, I my hardware store had seed potatoes last week, so seed potatoes are still available. Um, I'm not sure about um, about sweet potatoes. Maybe one of you know whether you can still get sweet potatoes. I know some people will get an organic sweet potato from the grocery store and grow that. Um, and then when you're looking at pumpkins or winter squash, you need to know how many um, frost-free days you have because they're, they're frost tender. So if you were to plant them in the ground today, you'd need to know when your first frost was and count that many days to make sure you have enough time. So um, for me, um, anything that takes longer than 100 days uh, probably won't mature for me um, because I get frost by Labor Day weekend. And we actually had frost last night. It was, it was negative three here this morning. So, um, and I heard that there was snow in Alberta and uh, the mountain just above us got snow yesterday afternoon. Um, all right. Well, thank you for joining me. If you're catching this on the replay, um, I will come in and answer questions in the comments. So go ahead and leave questions if you still have more questions. Uh, today we talked about having a survival garden and the shift in thinking that you need to make um, in order to make sure that you have enough calories in your survival garden so that you can grow at least 50% of your own food um, in your garden without having to um, worry about whether the food is going to be there at the store or whether you can actually afford the food at the store. Um, 
and I'm happy to answer questions. Have a great week. And next week, we're going to be talking a little bit more about um, food and gardening for food, gardening for survival, and other things you need to take into account. So I will talk to you again next week. Bye-bye.